mechanisms, and uh, as we said, CRV1 is a Mueller uh, photosubmer cell interaction uh, problem, and uh, SEP290 is a ciliopathy. Okay, so uh, uh, Andrew Lottery, I said, uh, uh, put the two and two together along with uh, the group in Holland and uh, uh, realized that this is also a cause of, of LCA or early onset problems. And uh, so uh, we looked at it again and again and again. So, it, uh, so is it a potential target for optogenetics? This is a very serious early onset blindness. And you kind of figure, well, it's, it's a developmental problem. It's a real serious kind of issue. Let's stay away from these folks. Uh, I'm not so sure we should stay away from them because they've probably, uh, along with uh, RP that has advanced to the point of being what we showed, uh, are, are serious candidates for this type of, uh, of work, especially if you have a retina that looks like this, that's just thick and uh, unwieldy and uh, uh, dysplastic and uh, uh, really no photoreceptors to be seen or quantified. Um, I think we should uh, not dismiss this population, or, or we should actually include them, uh, because uh, they, they, they are not like RP65 LCA, they're not like one length cyclase uh, 2D uh, uh, LCA, so they're not some of the, uh, the ones that actually can be approached with a gene augmentation therapy or some other therapy. This is, these are the stem cell or optogenetics or uh, chip uh, possibly. Um, uh, people that, that should be in, included. So the bottom line here, uh, without taking too much time, is that uh, these ganglion cells and nerve fiber layers uh, were, uh, were present, detectable, uh, normal or thick. And finally, SEP290 LCA. SEP290 LCA is uh, in this group in, of ciliopathies, uh, of which there are many, causing retinitis pigmentosa and also causing uh, LCA. And uh, so, uh, we discovered uh, that, uh, uh, unlike the RD16 model, which is, you know, it's, it's a mouse, uh, the humans actually uh, uh, retain uh, considerable, uh, and this is normal, but considerable cone photoreceptors with very, very abnormal uh, inner and outer segments. Uh, and these are very severe. These are hand motions, low, low per, uh, light perception people. This is. Uh, this is not uh, a typical RP, with, uh, as we showed, uh, with 2020 visual acuity being supported by this outer nuclear layer. These, uh, uh, these layers are really uh, uh, not functioning on the assumption that that's the cause. So uh, in a group like this, uh, it has been reported uh, by uh, Joel Fishman and others that, that you can, uh, at some point in some careers, get a, a serious uh, 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 maculopathy for a SEP290 LCA person. And here's one example, but he's still sort of 2,800. Uh, so when he, if he presumes that, uh, presumes that he could continue to degenerate, then we, uh, he may become a candidate. All these people are not candidates because I think they really deserve a chance at some form of SEP290 uh, gene augmentation. Um, and uh, they do also have uh, sufficient uh, uh, ganglion cell and nerve fiber layer uh, quantities. So, uh, as I said, this is not uh, a, a talk that uh, embraces optogenetics only as a as a possibility, because uh, to me, things that work uh, should be should be uh, understood and then uh, applied uh, if they're safe and uh, and useful to the patients. So uh, we've been through uh, uh, some of the. Uh, 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 the silicon and the electronic sub, uh, subretinal implant uh, literature today. So, in conclusion, so optogenetic is an evolving uh, potential treatment modality for severe visual loss, and uh, RP and, and LCA can can really approach sufficient severity, uh, early or late, uh, of the dysfunction, but do warrant consideration of the actual anatomy behind the dysfunction. Because what we don't want to do uh, is uh, miss out on some of these diseases that have a dissociation of function and structure, whether it's RP65 or guanylate cyclase or, or SEP290. Uh, and we should actually reserve those patients, if it's not uh, rapidly progressive, uh, for a non-optogenetic uh, approach to test whether that's, uh, that's a sensible approach to these diseases. But then we'll also have the opportunity with the development of these particular types of uh, treatment modalities. Uh, to, uh, to use them subsequently if we need to. I want to thank again the Hope for Vision for supporting much of this work, and uh, thank you all for listening.
thank you for the meeting organizer to give me the opportunity to present here. Uh, I think the last time I was here several years ago, we just started our phase two studies. So today, I'm going to report <coughs> the results of our three phase two study. So uh, uh, as you know, very exciting uh, morning that a lot of progress has been made, and I'm glad to uh, share some of the progress um, at New York Tech. So I'm going to talk about encapsulated cell technology. Uh, the concept of technology <coughs> is very simple. Uh, basically, you use mammalian cells and genetically engineered cells to secrete a therapeutic factor. In this case, I'm going to focus on CNTF. The uh, genetic modified cells were then encapsulated in a semipermeable ca capsule. The capsule allows the uh, free diffusion of a nutrient into the cells and to uh, support cell uh, survival. It allows therapeutic factor to diffuse out of the capsule, yet it prevents direct interaction of the cells uh, with the host immune system therefore allow long-term survival of the implant. <coughs> so this is a illustration of our current ophthalmic implant. Uh, as you can see, it's a six millimeter in length uh, with a cell to scaffold inside, and then there's a loop at one end that facilitate the anchoring onto the sclera. So there's a picture of our final product. That is a product shipped to the clinic. Um, in fact, that, uh, you know, University of Miami um, was one of our site participating in the study. So uh, this um, particular slide has been presented by many presenters before me, is that an uh, ocular treatment is different if you have a drug with a limited duration of action that requires uh, repeated administration. Now with ECT technology that eliminated that need that with one application should last for many years of treatment effect. So I'm uh, happy to inform you that our long-term delivery uh, uh, kinetics study has been published in IVOVS, and then we also made it cover. So this is to share with you the, um, the cellular uh, graft that's explanted from the patient out to 24 months, and then you can see excellent cell viability throughout implantation period. And this will show you the delivery kinetics over the course of uh, two years that uh, CNTF output was consistent throughout, and then the vitreous level uh, was also correspondingly consistent. Um, very exciting that we have a most recent explant. It didn't make it to the slide yet. We just got the data. It was five and a half year explant. The production level is about the um, same as a six month, and the uh, explant uh, cell viability looked absolutely beautiful, so we know that the host has fully accepted our implant. So this is just to uh, give you some background of the technology, and then um, after that, I can show you some uh, representative data. So I know I'm the last one before lunch, so I promise we'll do it very quickly. <laughs> so we um, have demonstrated the safety and the tolerability of the implant and the surgical procedure, and we have shown stable drug delivery up to two years. And now I'm uh, very confident we actually can do beyond that, although very small and we only have a one case. But uh, in this kind of study, that just proved the concept of the delivery technology. And most importantly, the drug level that achieved is efficacious by um, measure of a photoreceptor preservation. So I'm going to show you with you some of data through our collaboration with UCSF and UC Berkeley. So what are the major class of molecules this technology could deliver? Okay, so I'm going to show the data of a CNTF, but that's not the only thing we're able to deliver. So we have been successful in engineering our cell lines to produce various kinds of antibodies, receptor FC molecules, such as allele like the molecule, and the cytokines and hormones. So we have current uh, clinical study for NT503 which is for white EMD. I'm not going to talk about today. I don't have the time for that. But uh, we also have a NT506, which is anti-PDGF, which is in combination with NT503 that uh, can achieve better efficacy. And then uh, obviously we'll have a number of other programs. But today I'm gonna to focus on the NT501, which is a CNTF program. 
<laughs> so the uh, NT51 study, the preclinical and clinical is focused on, of course, the scientific rationale would justify uh, to go to a clinic, and then long-term uh, intraocular delivery, and that is the uh, proof of concept for the technology. And I'm going to show the key results now for the phase two study. So um, if you do a Google search on CNTF, you probably easily pull out several hundred publications, but this is just a few of our own that uh, we are able to show using our cell line, our cell produced CNTF, to show that CNTF um, can protect retina. Okay, just a few examples here. Uh, this is a collaboration with Ron Wen, uh, one of your um, faculties here, to show that uh, in the absence of CNTF, the photoreceptor has only one layer remaining with our <coughs> cell line without CNTF expression, one and one half layers. But if the cell use secreted CNTF, the picture is very different. So we have five to six layers. So we know that is a repeat of many other people's results, but we just want to show with our cell line, we can show that as well. So this is to show, again, as a collaboration with the wrong one in a uh, animal model of um, rod and cone degeneration by implanting with our devices uh, that secrete CNTF that we're, we're not only able to rescue the um, cone for the receptor and then cone of the segment, we're also able, which is very critical, okay, to uh, preserve the function. So uh, in this case, it shows the ERG level with the treated um, compared to the control. Okay, so this is quite important. Um, uh, Preclinical results that justify us to go to the clinics. So now, just briefly, so for this audience, I don't have to really introduce RP. Uh, just quickly, um, most importantly, that even in the preclinical area, several hundred papers, probably a dozen animal models, have shown the preservation of cone photoreceptors, but we are the first one. Okay, in collaboration with J.K. Duncan UCSF and Austin Rod at UC Berkeley to demonstrate CNTF treated eyes actually preserved cone photoreceptors in human patients. So this is one example um, showing the sham treated eye versus CNTF treated eye. That in sham treated eye, that over the course of a two to three years, there is a drop in density of cone photoreceptors, but in comparison, CNTF treated eye did not drop. Okay, so the two percent change is within the um, measuring error, which is about five to six percent. So this should just show you a sham treated eye uh, at the baseline and 21 months after, 35 months after, that you can measure the cone photoreceptor density and it showed a 20 percent drop in cone density from baseline of this patient. Now. In contrast, this is the same patient, contralateral eye, received a CNTF implant and baseline 15 months to 35 months, and then you can count all the cones, and then there's no change in cone density. So this is quite exciting uh, to us because this is the first time ever in human patients we're able to measure the uh, photoreceptor density. So this is to summarize all the low size, and then this data derived from three different patients one eye received CNTF implant, the other eye was sham control. As you can see, in general, the uh, sham treated eye had a tendency to have a drop in cone density. CNTF treated eye, there's a you know, little bit variability, but they're all within the range of measuring error. So basically, CNTF treatment maintains cone density all to uh, almost three years, 35 months. So um, we also conducted, in addition to our PSA, the GA study. Um, this is uh, just a very a brief um, summary of the GA to show you the uh, works published in PNS. In this case, that patient received a high dose implant, low dose, which served as a placebo, and then we have a sham control. So when you look at the, um, the treatment, the high dose tre uh, treated patient had a tendency to stabilize vision and the low dose and the sham had a tendency to lose vision. So in this case, it's a small sample size. It did not reach statistical significance. The study wasn't designed to show statistical significance. It's just a pilot study to show if there's any uh, readout in terms of efficacy. Now, if you look at patients who entered the study with better vision, over 2063, 
Then the picture is very clear. All high dose treated patient maintain steady vision, and then the control and sham loss vision. You know, this is by 15 letters um, change. Now, people will ask, how about the mean visual acuity change? You know, maybe you have everybody change 14 letters, right? So we look at the mean acuity change, the, the same observation uh, stays, right? So high dose treated by the end of the, uh, the treatment had the average 0.8 letter increase, we call this stable. Now the control arm, as you can see by the end of the same time period, 12 months, had 9.7 letter loss. So both responder rate and mean acuity showing the uh, treatment effect of CNTF was favored in this uh, um, uh, population. The reason we actually did not see this type of, um, I would say, uh, benefit in RP was in RP both treated group and the sham group did not lose vision. So it's more chronic. So in this case, it is uh, a faster deteriorating disease that's why we're able to show. So uh, just to summarize that we decided just because uh, for a GA study, it's not orphan, it require at least 100 to 200 million to conduct phase three study. Thousands of patients included. We are not, as a small biotech company, able to uh, finance the study. So we're focused strategically on orphan indication with both FDA and the EMA. So we are actively pursue path forward for phase three using comfort receptor preservation as an endpoint and then uh, with other secondary endpoint to support functional benefit. Okay, so we uh, we're now uh, make a lot of progress in, in this area. So I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. And okay, so we're now switching the gear. I think a part of the things I'm, uh, this is a part of the effort that uh, we've been working on the lab. And I think from what you hear from the entire morning, and one of the message we got is uh, the retina, when it's injured, damaged, or diseased, it cannot repair itself. So something has to be done in order to restore vision. And that's how our ideas came from saying, can we awaken or make our retinas regenerate itself or repairing itself? Although it sounds like a fantasy, but these things happen in this world. Let me try, okay. And so when I say this happens, it actually happens to fish or lower vertebrates. And so as, although we think human is the one of the most superior animals in this world, and there's something we have to jealous uh, about fish, and that is because fish can always regenerate the retina no matter what happens. You can wipe out the retina and they'll just grow a new one. And however, if you compare the structures or cell types sitting in the fish retina and the human retina, we're actually very similar. We have almost all the similar cell types. We have combs, rods, photoreceptor cells, ganglion cells, and Mueller cells. And actually, Mueller cells are believed to be one of the uh, major uh, retinal progenitor cells. When the fish retina is damaged, it will start to pull out, uh, pull uh, back into the cell cycle and generate all kinds all kinds of retinal cells. So there are plenty of mirror cells sitting in our retina. Why we don't do it? And so that's the question we were trying to address. And so uh, this is the cell, uh, this is the mirror cells that, uh, uh, that, uh, that is normally sitting in our retina with the cell bodies located in the middle uh, in the nuclear layer and with cellular process expanding the entire retina. And normally it's thought the cells are maintaining a function is by maintaining a retinal function, uh, a normal neuronal uh, environment. And uh, actually, more and more recent studies suggesting that these cells, even in the mammals, also displays a molecular similarity with retinal progenitor cells. And uh, there are actually, we as one of the few, uh, the first labs demonstrating these cells, even in mammals, like from mouse, also have the capacity to divide, re-enter the cell cycle, and even generate all different type of retinal cells. So I'm going to quickly show you just two slides and uh, about evidence we're showing that uh, the normal retina, have you, as you have heard in this morning, if you inject the BRD, you try to label uh, the proliferating cells, the normal retina doesn't have you almost could not find any proliferating cells. And however, as uh, one of the experiments we were trying to do, actually we're trying to injure the retina, and we're trying to figure out what is the, uh, I mean glutamate is one of the neurotransmitters that we know that uh, we often use to injure the retina. So we're trying to figure out what is the optimal dose to injure the retina, 
And then we found out actually when you inject at a very low dose, so let's say one microgram into the retina, and then we actually all of a sudden see lots of BRDU positive cells. Well, it turns as a surprise, it's suggesting that when there's a subtoxic signals enter the retina, it could trigger a potentially retinal progenitor-like cells to proliferate in the retina. And this, ret this, this proliferating cells, as, as when we um, further uh, examine a study and, and actually demonstrate they are mirror cells because they express the mirror cell marker at the first 24 hours. Although after a while, they will lose this uh, progenitor cell marker and turn into uh, differentiated retinal cell markers. And second, we also used another uh, chemical called alpha amino adipate, which is the glutamate analog. And however, it's bind primarily to mirror cells rather than neurons. And you can see that it actually exerts even better, more if, uh, effective effect in inducing uh, mirror cell proliferation. So further showing that uh, this is really mirror cells that are undergoing differentiation, re-enter the cell cycle and undergoing uh, regenerative potential. So if we pull out these uh, mirror cells, proliferating mirror cells, and put them in culture, they actually can differentiate into uh, all kinds of retinal cells. I mean, primarily, there will be uh, GFAP. Probably over 50% of cells will become GFAP uh, positive glial cells. And however, you can also find beta-3 tubulin positive neurons, uh, endocrine cells, syntaxin positive, and uh, bipolar cells, PKC alpha positive, or recovering, which is a photoreceptor cell. They're not only differentiating to these cell types and express their corresponding markers, they show the morphology, just look like those cells. And in vivo, when we inject into subretinal space, and within six hours, actually, you can see, I mean, normally, uh, the mirror cells will stand with a nucleus, uh, with a very like well-lined up uh, uh, nuclei sitting in the, in the nuclear layer. And however, after we inject the uh, a glutamate or alpha amino adipate into the subretinal space, which is located somewhere around this or here on, on the down uh, levels, and you can see that this uh, in the nucle this in the nuclear nuclei is actually moved out of that band and entered the sub uh, entered the outer nuclear layer. This is within six hour and ten hour. If you wait a little bit longer, or even three days, actually you can see they differentiate and express the photoreceptor cell marker. So I'm just using those two slides and telling you that Mueller cells in mammals in mouse just have the capacity to um, to pulling out from this uh, back to the cell cycle and differentiate. And so why in humans we normally don't get our retina to regenerate? And so. Uh, but by asking this question, a couple of years ago, we were using the brain as a model because it's a basically a similar model as the uh, retinal neurons. And then we found out that in the brain, and uh, as, uh, in the brain, there are two uh, factors actually have been found to widely expressed in this non-neogenic brain area, which is called FRN2 and A3. And actually, the expression of the two, two molecules prevented the uh, neural stem cells, even seen, sitting in the other parts of the brain from re-enter the cell cycle and regenerate or undergo neurogenesis. So our question is, does this happen in the retina? If we knock out the FN A2 and A3, can we also make the mirror cells or retinal progenitor cells in the retina to pull back into the cell cycle? So I just want to mention that in retina, actually there are two types of uh, retinal progenitor cells. And another one is uh, uh, thought about sitting in the ciliary body. So we, express, we detect expression of an A2 and A3 and, and found that the expression of this somali, of this uh, is uh, afrin A's at least, actually um, uh, increased along, the, pro along the, uh, the developmental process. It basically inversely correlated with the retinogenesis in the developing retina, suggesting that the upregulation of these molecules probably preventing the proliferation and uh, retinogenesis. And then when we used the FN A3 non-cal mice, and we found uh, almost 20-fold increase in terms of the BRDU positive cells in the ciliary body. Uh, so you can see that this cells uh, um, BRDU positive while also express a uh, retinal progenitor cell marker chix 10 so indicating they are proliferating progenitor cells. In addition, when we knock down the uh, Afrin A3, and when we compare the neurospheres that isolated from wild type mice and the Afrin A3 non cow mice, and they actually up, uh, there's dramatic upregulation of all kinds of retinal progenitor cell markers, including SOX2, uh, uh, MES5, and uh, especially uh, the one impress uh, impressive group is WINT3, uh, WINT A, or WINT1 one, uh, one group. So you can see that it's uh, actually the drastically upregulated neural progenitor cell markers, suggesting there is an increased potential to generating new neurons. 
And then when we induce the cells to differentiate, actually the normal wild-type retinal cell, uh, cellular body-derived progenitor cells are very difficult to differentiate into retinal neurons. And they tend to become a photo uh, pigmented cells. And however, so you can see that we can easily pull out these cells, uh, induce differentiation while they downregulate the progenitor cell marker, like PEX6 and CHIX10. And while they upregulated the retinal progenitor cell marker, like rhodopsin, recovering, uh, PKC alpha. So it's basically all kinds of retinal neurons. And suggesting that uh, afferent A3 actually acting as a very important negative niche, not only preventing the proliferation, but also preventing the neural regenesis, uh, new genesis of uh, uh, retinal stem cells. So this is showing not only the morph morphologically, now we are able to uh, differentiate this uh, cellular derived uh, progenitor cells into a neuronal like cells. And functionally, we actually recorded the uh, action potential from these cells, and which uh, uh, responding in, uh, uh, in a, a like in a stimulation dependent pattern. So it's very similar to what we would see. Uh, in the normal uh, ganglion cells or neurons. And one thing I really want to point out is uh, actually we did different time points. So if you increase, uh, induce differentiation the one week and you don't see any activities, well, if you wait for uh, three weeks, now you can see the early differentiation, like uh, spontaneous uh, uh, reactions and uh, activation potential is mimicking the early immature neurons. And however, if you wait for five weeks, it looks very similar to the mature ganglion cells. So, uh, so my time is up, so I just use these two slides very quickly in telling you that we further looked at the receptors that are offering uh, A3 uh, acting through, and then we pull out in the retina, it's actually more of F A4. And also, it's uh, functioning by uh, acting through suppressing uh, the beta catenin and uh, wind pathways. So um, the A3 knockout mice have the increased beta catenin pathway activity. And if you add the wind through A3, uh, 3H to the wild type, you can also increase or stimulate the uh, proliferation. So I guess at this point, and our conclusion is, the uh, retinal progenitor cells, and, and including the mirror cells, they have the potential to serve as a main, uh, to generate different kind of retinal neurons. And however, this their regenerative potential is inhibited by the negative niche that's sitting in the mammalian retina environment. And afferin A3, as we identify, is the functions that uh, play this inhibitory roles. And therefore, for the future therapeutic uh, potentials, we're thinking that uh, antibodies or inhibitors that targeting this pathway would have uh, a potential uh, uh, clinical implications for uh, promoting the retinal repair or regeneration. So uh, last, I uh, just want to thank the uh, people in my lab, and especially uh, Dr. Yuan, uh, Fang Yuan, who, is, uh, who did most of this work. And thank you. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> thank you, Betty. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing this wonderful conference. It's a, a real treat and, and pleasure for me to be here with you today. Certainly, I've uh, learned a, a great deal from, from each of you. I'd like to talk to you about uh, chemical screen that we performed recently. Uh, what we're interested in is, is trying to protect the, the cones uh, in retinitis pigmentosa. And, and for some people, they've, they've turned this the, the bystander effect, but I think of it more as uh, the innocent bystander. For many forms of, of RP with rod-specific mutations, the, the cones just seem to be sort of in the wrong place at, at the wrong time. And certainly, for many patients with retinitis pigmentosa, if we were able to take the condition and turn it into something more akin to congenital stationary night blindness, it would have a, a profound functional implication for, for those patients. This, for instance, is a 62-year-old female that I saw with CSNB, no discernible rod function, a, a confirmed rhodopsin kinase mutation, but 20-25 vision, full visual fields, and really the, the only functional thing that she had to do is have the flashlight app on her iPhone, and, and she was pretty much from a day-to-day -day standpoint uh, very well set because for all intents and purposes, we live in a photopic world. So our idea, so our idea was to, to try to identify neuroprotective factors for cones that may help them just survive longer in terms of shifting the curve to the right a little bit. Um, no different than, for instance, when I was a, a medical student, there was a whole floor of the hospital dedicated to, to AIDS. It was the, the AIDS floor. And 
four years later, we no longer had an AIDS floor, not because we cured HIV, but simply with triple therapy, we shifted the curve to the right. And so potentially doing something like that for, for cones may be meaningful for, for our patients. So our first sort of foray into to trying to identify cone protective factors in retinitis pigmentosa with, was with FAS. And like many, and I, I don't have to tell this to a room full of, of scientists, like many things in, in the lab, it, it didn't work on one hand, but on the other hand, we, we learned something important from that. And the reason we were interested in, in FAS was if anyone's done any work in the, the cancer field, FAS is one of these mediators that's released from, from cells that can stimulate cell death in, in neighboring cells. And so it's a ligand receptor pair, and, and the thing that was interesting about FAS is if you mine gene expression profiles of retinal degeneration mice, FAS is, is upregulated. And so we thought this might be uh, an, an interesting molecule and signaling pathway to, to explore. So the first thing we did was just to see if FAS was present in the, the human retina, and it co-localized to cone photoreceptors. The next thing we, we needed to, to figure out, though, was whether or not it was playing any functional role in, in the retina. And for this, we devised a phototoxicity assay, uh, an in vitro model where we took cone photoreceptors.